Welcome Joystick Justice League to the fourth episode of Roundtable. I'm Mike Frusios. I'm Joe Morton. And I'm Jay Couture. Yes, yeah, special guest Jay Couture from the Recoil Gaming Network. You can check out his fantastic feed on Twitch TV under Recoil Gaming and on YouTube at the Recoil Gaming Network. Uh, tell us a little bit before we get started about what you've been doing recently on Recoil, Jay. Uh, I've been pretty much putting everything into place. Uh getting the Twitch up, we've been getting intro videos, uh, deciding on review schemes and everything, and just streaming, uh, you know, just having fun playing games, uh, and getting a little bit of a viewer base before we actually launch, and that's where we're at right now. Yeah, and uh, you, you mentioned that you have like a very high retention rate, like uh, you have, I don't like, because you, like, typically videos go at the hour mark, you go to the hour and a half mark, yet you keep your viewers going the whole time, which is, is a lot to say for the quality of your broadcast. Yeah, we've had uh, Plague Inc. stream, um, it's 30, 36 minutes in length, and the average watch time is about 34 minutes. That's pretty um, awesome. Eight, or not 800, um, about uh, 60 odd views on that, and um, our Diablo 5 stream, uh, it's about 244 views, and uh, the average watch time on that is well over an hour. That's awesome, wow. man. I think I saw there was a, quite a bit of anticipation for uh, not only Diablo 3 in general, but that expansion pack. So uh, I think that's why you've been uh, racking up the views, which is, uh, which is awesome. Yeah, major hype around that, especially Sony fans who are kind of debating whether they sh who bought the PS3 version or debating should I get the PS4 version that's coming out with the expansion pack included I'm definitely getting that when it comes out so I'm, I'm pretty excited oh I'd be getting uh, it for sure oh absolutely especially because what's happening with the PS4 version is that they're actually going to change the user interface so that you can actually basically control the character more intuitively with with the actual dual shock which is interesting yeah so we've got a pretty awesome uh, podcast going for roundtable episode four today. Uh, pretty hot topic, still um, an ongoing topic. Really, this is never going to go away. But there are a few news items that really are fueling our decision to do this particular podcast. So this one's called the ironic failure of video game censorship, a major issue. So uh, there's a there's a few points we want to cover. I guess we have to start this podcast by starting out where censorship came from. So. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Joe. Like, what are your earliest memories of censorship and banned games? For me, for me, uh, what uh, I think really launched kind of like the yes, the, uh, the yes, or the, uh, the the game censorship. Uh, you know, really started uh, around the Mortal Kombat days, which was uh, one of those first games. Uh, well, let's, let's say, with, I mean, Doom, and uh, they, you know, they they were that was back in the day when things weren't censored. But that was like the first kind of mainstream came, game that came out that really kind of push the, the boundaries, right? That was around 92. Yeah. What do you remember about that period, Jay? I remember uh, Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Not well, yeah, around there. Mortal Kombat 1 and um, the blood issue and that. Um, my God, I mean, that was a, a huge issue for Nintendo and it, you know, it ended up changing a lot of their policies. Oh my God, like, uh, you remember, we all remember the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat 1 and we all famously remember infamously remember that the blood was taken out and replaced with sweat and the fatalities were modified most notably Sub-Zero where instead of ripping the head out with the spine attached you freeze the guy and break him into a bunch of little cubes and what was funny about this game is that this basically changed Nintendo's policies going forward like most people can agree <coughs> pardon me agree that it was really one game that 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 basically forced Nintendo to say shit or get off the pot. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, that was uh, up until up until that point, games were really kind of, you know, they weren't bound by censorship at all. Like I said, you had like uh, Wolfenstein, Doom, you know, back in the, the, the shareware PC days where games were just totally wide open and nobody was, was censoring it at all. Yeah, it seems like the censorship started on the consoles before anything else, which was kind of weird. I think it's because of the way that the two factions were viewed back in those days. PC gaming was really something for like the college students, the techies, like it was a very, you know, like programmers were into it and stuff, but not the general public. The general public was really ignorant of video games. It was, it, Nintendo was considered to be a children's toy. And, and I think that that whole mentality is really carried over into modern days. And, and that's why it, that, that mentality had hit a wall in the 90s, you know? Like Mortal Kombat was really what forced Nintendo to decide, okay, are we get, are we gonna view this 
this, this, this console we have as a toy anymore or as something larger than itself that has to evolve. And we saw that happen with the Wii to an extent, but I mean, it, there's so many other examples, really. I mean, it, goes, it really does go much further back than, than people realize. I mean, if, 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 you look, if you remember the game Ice Climber for the NES, that actually had to have the baby seals taken out because of complaints about baby seal clubbing, like, and the, the perceived uh, controversy that would arise out of that. So they, they had to replace it with some with, with Yetis or something. And, and you mentioned a good one too, Joe, Leisure Suit Larry. Yeah, that, like, was, that thing almost got away with murder. Oh, it did. I mean, you, you literally had, had like a little kind of a, of a loser guy. Like it, it, it was just like it, it was. I mean, the, the, the topic of sex. You know, that, that was one of the first games that really, really touched on that topic and really, you know. Seemingly like, like uh, just push to try and offend people. I think what shocked people the most is that um, at that time when Leisure Suit Larry first came out, it came from Sierra, who yes. at the time was making, I'm not going to say kids games, but uh, King's Quest and, and Space Quest and, and whatnot. You know, it, there was no sex involved. You know, it was pretty much for little kids, well, not little kids, but, you know, like teenagers. And all of a sudden they come up with Leisure Suit Larry on the side. I mean, and the game was just pure unadulterated adult fun and nothing you know like it there was no issue about it until we started seeing Le leisure suit larry with magna cum laude come to consoles and then all of a sudden oh my god there's sex on a console and you can't have that and that really goes back to the, the again the in the 80s and 90s when in the very early origins of pc gaming and console gaming just the, again the way it was viewed you know PC, people who owned like an ibm 386 or 486 and gamed on it or a tandy or an amiga weren't your average people it was it was again people who were invested in the computer culture or who were or who are kind of nerdy or whatever you know that's that's who i remember play it but it was also the older brothers the older sisters who were into pc gaming and their younger brothers were into nintendo that's kind of the situation was with me my brother was into like the, the PC games because he was in college at this point. He had access to software and all that stuff, and he didn't really invest time with Nintendo. And, and that's the thing. But those older brothers and sisters would get games like Space Quest and King's Quest, who they're like, okay, this is okay for my little brother or sister to play because you know it's not violent, it's story based, it might teach them something, it's fun, it's a little bit more advanced than what they're playing on their little NES console right now. But that's the problem, you know, older brother or sister gets invested in those Sierra games, then all of a sudden they want to play Leisure Suit Larry, it's in the house, and then all of a sudden I end up playing it when nobody's around, you know, and I got really into Leisure Suit Larry at a young age. Yeah, and another, uh, uh, a couple of other apartments too are also with uh, Wolfenstein and Bionic Commando and the whole issue of, with uh, the Nazis, Hitler, and that whole issue there of having, having to take those things up because uh, in Germany that's still a very, very sensitive issue right well yeah we saw it on the snes port of wolfenstein 3d they had to take out hitler they had to take out the nazi symbols and all that stuff right but it's funny joe you mentioned earlier that it, it didn't seem like you know games like doom and wolfenstein were censored here yet what we're going to be getting into later on this podcast is that yes there were some major changes in censorship going on abroad you know and especially in the uk australia um Jay, what, what, what other kind of historical references can you recall in terms of censorship? What led us to where we are today? Well, there, there was a lot of um, exterior issues that had nothing to do with gaming that you know, led us to where we are today. I mean, Columbine being a classic example. Oh, you yes. Know, Columbine brought... Like, Doom was a, a big game, don't get me wrong, in the gaming circle. If you weren't in the gaming circle, you didn't know about Doom. You didn't know about Wolfenstein. You didn't know about any of that stuff. And exactly. when Columbine happened, the first place the finger was pointed was at ID Software and Doom. Because the parents felt that because those kids had at one point played that game, that must have motivated them to go and blow away their classmates. Which, as we all know, coming from a gaming perspective, we all know it's a load of shit. Yeah, this is getting to, to a big and kind of major issue with this podcast. And when it comes to these, uh, these uh, incidents like Sandy Hook and Columbine, that, uh, you know, like you said, Jay, most of us have played these games and never acted on it. And this actually comes down to what, what uh, the reason why most of us play games is that uh, for, for, I would say, 99% of us, this is a kind of a, a release and a kind of an escape from reality where we can do things that we could normally do in real life. And 
for 99% of us, it stays there. It doesn't go beyond that. And some of these people that have been involved in some of these incidents, like Sandy Hook, they were already previously violent people. Uh, did these games, uh, you know, kind of help that along? Sure, but they already had, had they were already previously already violent and mentally disturbed people, right? Exactly. It's it's only going to magnify what you are. I mean, come on, give me a break. I mean, if there weren't violent video games, you don't think that violent people would be. I mean, come on, we already know that, like, I, I know gangbangers who, who were directly influenced by Scarface and by watching Boys in the Hood, you know, by listening to Dr. Dre, by, lis you know, listening to, like, 50 Cent, you know? Whether it's, there, it's, it's, it's the idea of art in general can be either, like you're saying, Joe, to a normal mentally sane person be an outlet for something you can't do in real life, versus an in, like a, a, a sort of a simulator for somebody who does have those tendencies. And, and that's the problem, man, because once Doom kind of brought the first person shooter genre into like the mainstream and made it work, I think that's when everything just got really fucked up for, for this whole issue right here. Because now you're in the first person, okay? Then you get, let's flash forward a bit, you get the Navy Yard shooting. What was the, what was the, what was the culprit? Call of Duty. Oh, he used to play Call of Duty 16 hours a day. We'd have to feed him while he's playing it. And, and this made him a trained sniper. No. no the, yeah, the, that's a load of shit. Yeah, the majority of Call of Duty players, if they were to pick up a, a regular rifle or a gun, they would pick it up and probably go, well, where, where's, the, uh, where's the square button to reload? They probably wouldn't even know how to operate a real gun. A real gun, kids, has recoil, okay? It requires aiming, which you have to be trained to do. Yeah, the recoil that you're gonna get on screen is nothing compared to the actual real thing. I mean, it's not what? a training simulator per se. I mean, yeah, it's gonna boost your reflexes, but uh, unless you actually know how to use the gun, it's not gonna do a damn thing for you. At most, I, what I would... Okay, so I'm always the devil's advocate because I want to push the conversation in new directions. Okay, yes. I'm, I'm trying to think of why, why they're so afraid of, of Call of Duty and all these first-person shooters. Okay. To some extent, you could argue that it's a ground warfare simulator. That it teaches you duck and cover mechanics, uh, how to work in a squad. Um, but even then, I mean, here's the problem, okay? You take somebody who's violent, they're playing Call of Duty all day, then they go put on Scarface, then they go listen to some gangster hip-hop. It's just a negative energy that you surround yourself with all day. And video games aren't the catalyst for that. It's just it's just one part of, of an unmonitored process. I think essentially if you want to lay any kind of blame, you could blame it on blame it on mass media in general. Yes, that's a very good point actually. I agree because here's the thing we constantly see. Oh, GTA okay, when GTA 5 came out uh, and this was this it, the funny thing was that the Navy Yard thing happened while I was like lining up for GTA 5. So it was just you know, the, it was easy right there. And then all of a sudden, people are talking about GTA 5 coming out and, and the Navy Yard shooting and Adam Lanza with the Sandy Hook thing and how he played Grand Theft Auto and all that stuff. And it's, it's funny that they, they're so quick to point fingers and say, this is bad, this is bad, but they don't actually sit down and play the games themselves and try to critique it. And if they just spent half an hour with the radio stations and the TV stations and actually followed the story and critiqued it for even a half an hour, they'd realize that this is satire. This is actually trying to, it's like a mirror that it's holding up to society. It's its its not glorifying, like, yes, okay, fine, you do have to kill people, but you're, it's not glorifying what you're doing. It There are consequences to this stuff. There is a message here. And, and I think that's the problem with the, the people who are trying to attack this. They're, 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 they're just going on a superficial level and, and that's, that's why that's why this doesn't evolve at all. I don't understand why they they never go after movies. I mean, you look at a lot of the movies; it's a, it's a, a glorification of violence. And and look at um, around the time that uh, Grand Theft Auto Two came out, we had Saving Private Ryan came out, and. Yeah. You know, look at Save at Saving Private Ryan. I mean, my ex-wife can't even watch that movie without wanting to vomit. It's pure violence. You know, the start of it is horrific. And you look at Grand Theft Auto, and I, I, I really, I don't see it. I mean, 
these little pixelated characters make people want to go kill people, but seeing the real thing in a movie has no effect on them whatsoever. It, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's almost like a bit of a double standard, right? I agree. I, I think, again, because it's like society has to grow up in, it, in, toward, in its attitude and in how it perceives the video gaming genre. We have to get out of this idea. We really have to divorce ourselves from this idea that it's a kid's toy. We really have to just accept this as another form of storytelling alongside movies, theaters, theater, novels, music. Uh, and once we start taking that mature attitude towards it, we can we will we'll be more we'll start viewing them like movies. Like why is it that when I was growing up, there was no chance that I was going to get an R-rated movie from a blockbuster video. No way that 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 like that my parents were going to go buy one for me or that the the store clerk would sell it to me or whatever. But now, why is it that video games like why are parents buying M-rated games for their kids whereas they would never buy them an R-rated movie on Blu-ray? Like why where why does that discrepancy come in here? I'd have to say that a lot of the major games nowadays are M-rated. But that's the thing, like, and they're getting into ki the hand kids' hands at Christmas, birthdays. I see it all every day. Why is it that it's okay to buy your kid Assassin's Creed, but it's not okay to buy him, you know, Bad Grandpa? This is where you know where it's gonna have to start falling a little bit on you. The, the distributors like EB, Microplay, all, all, the, all the usual suspects. They, they, I think there's gotta be a bit of a better kind of a process, like when it comes to like a. Like obviously, like, like say, like a mother and a kid are going to buy a game. It's got to fall into the retail. They got to they got to ask more questions. They're like, you know, they, you know, who's going to be playing this game? Are you buying this for your son? And then they should say, you know, t tell them that the, the retailers are going to be knowledgeable about the games and tell them, you know, and say retail, no, this isn't a game that I would recommend for you to buy for your child because of what we've been talking about, right? Yeah, but when you're dealing with distributors and whatnot, it isn't about that. It's about dollars and cents. Uh, we live in a world now of pure 100% unadulterated capitalism and it's to the point where you know the shareholders value more than morals and this is where we're at right now you know what you're not gonna find a retailer that's gonna be like oh I don't think you should buy that for your kid they're gonna be like oh man buy that and this and this and this and it's more money in my pocket so then it's gonna have to it's, it's gonna have to start falling upon uh, the parents they're, about, they're gonna have to you know sit down and talk to the kids about this stuff because i mean uh, like you're saying you know that, that obviously that's not gonna the distributors are though they're they're trying to sell their games it's gonna have to come down to these to these parents and, and to, to actually talk to the kids about this stuff i agree i i i here's here's the thing you know kind of jumping ahead a bit i i think that if you there's there's a big social pressure on parents today okay you know their the parents are busier the cost of living has risen so they have to work more hours both parents are working you know kids are going to school surrounded by all of their friends with with like and social networking and youtube and all this information flying at them right it's really hard to be a parent today and to be able to babysit your kids 24 hours a day and to and monitor everything they're doing but i'm going to give you an example like you know, I know I uh, my nephew. Um, you know, he's a he's he's uh, just started high school and everything. And um, when GTA Five came out, you know, he it's one of those big games that's obviously marketed to kids. You know, it's there's no filter. You know, they go on IGN just like we do, and, and it's right there front and center. They're curious. They want to know what all the hype's about. So we're debating. We're like with me and my brother whether we should get him the game and. Um, you know, we're just like, well, let's let's kind of wait and see how, how this goes. Like, I don't know, you know, like, I, I really don't want to be a hypocrite here. You know, I want to respect the rating and just say, you know what, there, there, there's the line that's drawn, like, you gotta wait to play this game. You know, I know how kids think, they're rebellious at times, you know, but he, there's gotta be a line, right? But anyway, he comes home from school and he's, he's he already played the game at his buddy's house. So boom, there you go, there's the whole house of cards falls right there. What would you do in that situation, Jay? You know what? There isn't much you can do nowadays. I mean, technology's everywhere. Um, when I was a kid, you know what? I went over to my buddy's place, you know, and we played Mario Kart and we played hockey. You know, if I had Doom 
you know what, which I did on the uh, SNES, my buddy came over and we played that together, you know, even though his parents were against that. That's normal kid behavior. As a parent, there really isn't anything you can do about it. I mean, some parents, you know, will cave in and they'll go, fine, you know what, you've played it, go buy the, the game for the, ki for the kid. There'd be others that would go to the extreme of, well, guess what, you're not hanging out with little Jimmy anymore. Um... You know, you got to take it with a grain of salt. It, it, it's, it's, it should be done on an individual basis. I mean, every child is different, just like every adult's different. And, you know, you got to explain to your kids about violence and about the content that they're dealing with and that what they're seeing isn't real. Now, now that you mentioned that, Jay, I'm curious because you being a, a parent, what, what's, your, what's your process when it comes to, to your kids in video games? Uh, my kids in video games, anything goes pretty much. I mean, uh, my 10-year-old has a copy of Grand Theft Auto V. Um, we've got, I don't know, multiple copies of Saints Row 4 and 3 kicking around here, and they play it all the time. But you know what? When it ultimately comes down to it, uh, most of my kids play Minecraft all the time. And when you look at Minecraft, it's, it's not really violent, you know, it's more creative than anything. So I let them make their own decision. I mean, we had to talk about violence and what you see many, many, many years ago. And it's never been an issue. I mean, my kids are less violent than I was. My kids have never been in a fight in school. I mean, I spent all of grade five in the office. You know, I, <laughs> it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make, it, I mean, like, when you look at it from a media perspective, I guess I'm a horrible parent. But, I mean... So long as they understand the difference between the two, I don't see what kind of issue there is. I mean, all they have to do is turn on the TV when I'm not home, put on the news, and they'll see the exact same thing. And, Jay, you know what? That's the thing, man. It's like we've, we've been taught that, that that's why this issue needs to evolve because right now you're sitting here saying, oh, am I a horrible parent because I did this? And I would say no because you've already proven that th it works when – you don't just put up these false walls for your kids say no no don't do, do that without explaining it to them why like and that's the key it's just talking to your kids man let letting them explore but also being there to point them in the right direction so it's the and I, and I know the reason is that you've you've probably sat with them and played the and i'm sure you explain some stuff to them and we, we, we we're so quick to forget how we think as kids you know when i was a kid Sometimes I would be curious and try to find something, see something that was a bit more adult, and it's like a punch to the gut. It's like, whoa, that's just too heavy for me. Yep. You, you instinctively know as a kid, it's like, whoa, I'm not ready for this yet. And that's what you're saying. Like, okay, they've played GTA V, but like you said, they play Minecraft, man. And that's what happened with, with my nephew, and, I, and I'm going to get to that right now. So as part B to what I was kind of leading up to, where I found out that he's playing at his friend's house, so my bro his birthday was coming up, and I knew he wanted the game, and I talked to my brother, and he's like, okay, you know what, just just get it. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm gonna get it, but I have a plan here. And, and when, I, when I brought it over, I made sure I had an afternoon to sit down with him and, and play out the first hour. And we did, like, and what I did was I made him listen to the radio station. I made him go to an apartment and watch the TV. You know, I, I explained to him in, in the, the most innocent way I could what the jokes were about. And just watching it go over his head, you know, I'm like, it, it, there's like that that ironic side of me that's like, ha, mission accomplished, you know. I just, I, I fucking psyched you out of it. It's like, I, I made you realize that this is way too old for you. Not just because, not trying to say you're stupid, but or that you're immature, but that you just haven't reached that life experience to appreciate this the way I do. And, and that's the thing. He get, he went back to his NHL hockey. He went back to his Call of Duty, but and he doesn't even really he he has it there, but he doesn't really play it that much. Maybe yeah, he like fucks a around it a bit. But the curiosity's been sas satisfied. It, it's like telling a kid not to smoke. Well, what's when they're in high school? It's like you no 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 don't smoke. Well, I'm gonna go fucking have a cigarette and find out for myself. Yeah, because uh, no you. Know. Even when we were kids, you know, if our parents would tell us to do something, and it's like, right away, we're just taking like, well, I'm going to go do it anyways, you know. So it's it all comes down to, to talking, and I think uh, Jay, you've gone about it in a very uh, in a very good way. Well, I found the uh, the other big thing um, that I didn't mention that um, we also discuss all the time is we also discuss current events. Uh, like my kids know about the Sandy Hook shooting. They know all about the background stuff, you know, with what's going on in the Ukraine. They know about that stuff. We have like daily political discussions around That's awesome. around you know the dinner table when we're eating, and and it, and it starts to show because yeah, at first my oldest son, you know, like oh Gary's mom, I'm gonna try playing that in real life kind of thing. 
now, no, he has a total understanding of the difference between the two things. And you know what? That has totally rubbed off on his younger brothers who, you know, look up to him and he helps them decide what to play and whatnot. And, and, and you know, it's got a lasting effect when they know the difference between what's going on in the real world and what's going on in their game. That's it, man. When they can connect the dots for themselves and see that, yes, doing this will lead to bad consequences. It's happening right around me. There are other kids that have fallen victim to this. That The kid's not stupid enough or immature enough to realize that simple truth. And it all comes down to what you're saying. Just just getting down on their level and, and, and figuring out what they like, you know, talking to them about the games that they do like. You know, trying to, instead of just, you know, oh, that's Minecraft, that's a game that my kids play, I have no idea what it's about. Get in there, man, to like, learn about what, what makes them tick. You'll learn a surprising amount about your own children and, and, and what's going on in, with youth in general just by spending a little time. So that, that's my, my challenge to parents. If you're gonna buy an M-rated game for your kid, that's your decision. You're not a bad parent or a good parent, but what makes you the better parent is if you pay the price for it yourself and, and actually take some time out of your day to say, I'm gonna sit down with my kid and watch him play Call of Duty and ask him questions about what he feels about the game and, and maybe give him my two cents as to what to, the bigger picture is of what he's doing right now. Yeah, no, I agree. No, and uh, I'd like to change gears a little bit here. I want to hit on a, on a big topic point that I, that I just saw on our agenda here. And that is that, uh, you know, going back to the beginning of the ES, uh, ESRB, ESRB. With, uh, and then Mortal Kombat days, uh, I think you can make a really strong argument that uh, this this uh, war on video game violence, if you want to call it that, with, uh, with uh, the censorship has arguably led to uh, an, an increase in violent material in video games. And that goes to the title of this podcast, The Irony of Video Game Censorship. I mean, Jay, you know, Joe, we, we saw GTA 5. I mean, there was a little bit of controversy around the launch, but is it getting censored? No. Is it in the news? No. No, dude, it, it, it's the opposite. It's the darling of the media. You know, it's, 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 the, it's high art. It's the thing that you, you have to be playing or you're uncool. So... And that's the thing, kids are playing this game, so has the ESRB worked for us, Jay? The ESRB, I mean, it's just a guideline, and that's the way I always look at it. I mean, okay, uh, game's rated G. Okay, well, I know no matter what, the kids aren't going to like it. Don't buy it. And then I go to, oh, it's uh, rated uh, 14. Oh, well, guess what? That's a good one. You know, that's how I look at it. I mean, kids don't even care about ESRB ratings. I My kids don't even know what it... I mean, yeah, they know what it looks like to see an M-rated logo, but... They really don't care. It's about the game itself. Uh, I mean, the rating system, I mean, it's not enforced. So, who really cares? It's just a joke. What about adults only ratings? Why don't we ever see those? And, why, and that's the thing, like, Leisure Suit Larry, going back, right? Because it was known to be an adult only game, that's why it wasn't censored. No, because I mean, if a game gets an adult only rating, it, it can't be sold in in, uh, in regular retail spots. I think, uh, you know, porn is that what is I that think, the rule? Like, I think basically porn shops would be the only ones that could sell it at that point. Yeah, so you I can't don't know. Go into I, I wish I could buy porn. porn. No, that's true. So Walmart probably wouldn't carry it. Game no. spots probably not going to carry it. No. And I think that's what forces uh, none of these games to get that rating because they just wouldn't be able to get sold on a on a on a, on a high enough level. Yeah, like I played some games like uh, the Witcher series, you know, which I would consider adult only. Um, you know, the con. Another very the, censored the, game in the UK. Yes, very censored in the UK. Um, absolutely great game. I, I totally recommend the series. But for grown ups, I mean, my kids don't play it. My kids hate it, you know, because they've tried to play it. And they got to the first sex scene in The Witcher 2, and guess what? They weren't even interested. And these are boys that are, you know, raging with hormones. It just and they didn't even care. It just no, it doesn't speak to them on the same level kids. that I did. I mean, I saw it as an art form. I mean, it's telling the story, just like nudity in a movie. Unless you're watching a porn, nudity in a movie is part of the story. And that's how it, it you know, worked with that game. It was the same thing. But, I mean, I totally agree it should have an adults-only rating. But, if it did, I mean, CD Projekt would be out of business. We all know that. Man, like, we, we, we like to think that kids are perverts and, like, they're, they're just, they just want this adult content. Man, when I was growing up and watching a, like, a more mature movie with my parents, like a action movie, and then a sex scene come up, dude, 
I don't want to be with my fucking parents watching that shit. I'm embarrassed. I don't even know what this sex stuff is. I don't know what they're doing to each other. I don't want to see that shit. I just want to see, like, the next action scene, man. So we got to give a little kids a little bit more credit, man. And, and give innocence a bit more credit than we deserve. We like to think that kids are all want to be little grown-ups because we, we really force that on them. We, we, we give in to like the kid the, the girls wanting to buy Lululemon pants and wearing makeup and and having and the, the, the kids having cell phones we just you know just let them have their innocence back man like we're, we're just I think we're pushing them too far um, culturally and, and that's really the mass media's fault just again like what you're saying Joe the irony of this like that we, we, we try to censor these games but yet the mass media which we know the kids are watching just glorifies all this stuff what gets all the attention Call of Duty Grand Theft Auto Assassin's Creed. All the violent games. Rayman Legends? Where was the mainstream publicity for that? Yeah. Where is the mainstream hype for Nintendo? All the newspapers shit on it. All the mainstream ones, anyway. All the mainstream critics and stuff like that. They, they all hype the same stuff. The violent, the sexy games. You almost Maybe gotta you wonder. You know what? This, is, this might be a little bit off topic. But you almost gotta wonder if there's not some form of uh, advertising conspiracy going on when you look at it that way you know like the call of duty is you know one of the biggest franchises in gaming history and every time a new one comes out it's always in the media violence 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 and it makes the kids go buy it but yet like you said uh mike with rayman legends you know we didn't hear anything about it nothing that's a pure word of mouth phenomenon if i ever saw it that's that's grassroots hype, right? Where Rayman Legends, yes, is a big multi-platform game, but it's because it's people like us saying, you have to play this. Oh, that's a kid's game. You have to play this. Oh, well, that looks easy. It's hard as fuck. <laughs> I watched you playing some of that uh, uh, some of that uh, when you were streaming the other night. Now, it, it, uh, it may have some kind of childish kind of content, but, uh, but at the core, gameplay-wise, it, 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 it's just a, it's a good part. It's just a good core uh, platforming game that, uh, that uh, I would say all three of us and uh, gamers of our type like to play. Well then really, like, I, I, I have to challenge the big outlets that IGN, GameSpot, you know, like, why? Why can't you, why can't we start promoting and like, actually no, like deconstructing this myth that it's not cool to play kids games. Like, why do I constantly see this in my social networks? Oh, oh, Doki Doki Universe, that looks gay. You know why? It's because- That you teaches you about humanity. But you look at you look at um, sites like IGN, GameSpot, and all that. Who are they owned by? They're all News Corp. Mar News Corp. like massive, massive media conglomerates. You know, so they're told what to say. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that conspiracy because I mean we could go on for days about that. But uh, that's why you know like when it, when uh, I do this stuff, yeah, sure, I could have went and applied at IGN. You know, I, they were looking for writers, but why would I do that when? I don't have that, I don't share that belief, you know, I, I would rather, you know, write for independent sites, I'd rather, I, I prefer to go to independent sites for my news, because, you know what, they will at least focus on these games that I've never heard of, it's not just Call of Duty all the time, yeah. it's not just Grand Theft Auto all the time. So, I mean, with those, with those big uh, outlets, like, you know, GameSpot and IGN, I mean, you're not going to be able to, uh, as a writer or, or a broadcaster, you're, you're just you're not going to be able to voice from actual opinion, like you said, Jay, you're going you're gonna to be basically be told what to say. Because Activision's giving you half your half your budget, you exactly. know. And, and here's the thing, man. I'm not. I can't knock these. Like I, I criticize these sites, but I don't knock them. I check them every day, like everybody else. I respect a lot of the personalities on there. But going. I'm sorry, Jay. I know you don't want to get into conspiracy. Let's talk <laughs> a little bit about that now. Having seen the rise of like corporate gaming sites and seeing the bullshit that happened in the seventh generation was, was was really what tuned me into what you're saying about this conspiracy of what they're trying to sell to, to the gaming public as what's cool and as what's good and especially the kids who, who get on this stuff and there's no filter there's no age filter to go into IGN and watch a video like a trailer for The Witcher 3 you know and, and, and like everybody say oh this is one of the games to look out for in 2014 one of the must have Xbox One and PS4 games of course teenagers are going to be and, and preteens are going to be like yeah man I want to be cool this looks like an awesome game dude I'm telling you, man, the, the seventh generation was mired by a lack of integrity, where it was obvious that everybody 
was sucking Microsoft's dick. They were calling for the death of Sony back in 07. The PlayStation's over, it's done. Multi-platform games suck, blah, blah, blah. It's too hard to program for. Every game review was always the Xbox version, and it was they made sure that you were seeing the Xbox version, and, and like every advertisement available for Xbox and other platforms. It was this whole massive like thing, just trying to get rid of the competition, and and, and people who knew how Sony worked and who were actually following the PS3 like I was, knew that this was all bullshit. That they were lying to us. Like that, like IGN and GameSpot were just given in to sensationalism. And that's really where I decided to go into independent myself. I'm like, no, nobody's, nobody's gonna, I'm not gonna tell the official story. Cause there's a lot of shit that goes on in this industry, man. Why do you think Ken Levine left Irrational and folded it? Why? Tell me guys, why, why did he really fold that company? Because he doesn't have he, under 2K, he doesn't get that artistic expression. I mean, there's there's way too many rules to follow. You know, when you look at the indie developers, I mean, like I said, I, I've said this, God, now going on like five months that indie in this coming generation that that's upon us now, indie is going to be the new AAA. Uh, it, that's where you get your new ideas. That's where you're you're going to get people taking risks. When it comes to um, like big publishers like 2K. Um, EA and whatnot, you're stuck in. This is what we want. This is we want it out now. We want it out by this date. And you know what? I saw this happen back in 2001 with Eidos Interactive. I've, I've dealt with some of the companies that um, used to publish under the, or used to develop under them and are now gone um, because Eidos was so set in their in their ways about what content they wanted out, when they wanted it out, that games were being released 50% done. Like, we're talking the buggiest messes you've ever seen, and just to make a profit. And now you see EA doing the exact same thing. Oh, God. Releasing works in progress like Battlefield 4. One of the most odd. And SimCity. Star like, what Wars the, fuck? the Old Republic. Oh, yeah. I mean, come on. It, it, this is. It's just going to get worse before it gets better, and it'll be like what happened in 2001 where, okay, Eidos didn't totally fold, but it was to the point where, you know, they were pretty much bankrupt, and some other publishers were able to come in and revive the industry, but I mean, that almost killed the industry then. Right now, I'm worried that, you know, with EA and their claws in, like, everything, that they will be the next to do the exact same thing. Yeah, and I think that's a big reason why, like uh, Ken Levine and Jeff, you know, that they've that they're they're branching out into these because they really want to, uh, you know, they really want to. I think get, get kind of get out of that mainstream, and they really want to execute their vision and, and really have the, the freedom to do more of what they want instead of being controlled by the by the big companies, right? Look at all the the major heavyweights that are leaving the mainstream industry. Look at Paul, Peter Molyneux. Look, look at. Um, yeah, he said that, uh, that Fable Three. He, I think he called it a train wreck. Oh yeah, I game. saw that the other day. Look at, uh, uh, yeah, just like like Ken Levine. Like man, like come on, ba Bioshock is all about Ann Rand and and that and that kind of shit. Bioshock Infinite was saying some major shit there. Like yeah. I mean, if you really read between the lines, and, and then when I see an article come out like a couple days after where Two K feels that the Bioshock universe still has many stories to tell, I'm like, oh god, no. Yeah, exactly. This is why he left. They yeah. want more sequels. They want a God of War Ascension. God of War Ascension didn't need, didn't need to be made. They made it anyway. Tanked the viability of that franchise, in my opinion. It's and, not uh, the franchise it used to be. And I uh, just saw an article today that uh, Santa Monica, they're, they're laying off a bunch of people. Yep. You know? And uh, the, the, those you know, those people that have gone, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be more people that are going to go out uh, and become India and uh, and really push the boundary which uh, like Jay said this this generation that's now upon us I, th I think the, the Indies are really gonna dictate what's gonna happen in this generation well the nice well, thing is too when it comes to indie is that it's it's cross-platform now it's not something that you know was just PC uh, you've, you've got the Xbox community, you know, the indie developers, you've got your PlayStation indie developers, you're starting to see your Nintendo indie developers, and now with Steam and the Greenlight program, I mean, they're indie reach, is definitely going to, indie's going to be where it's at. They're going to, they, they can just, they can reach a larger audience. And now and with, can, yeah. and now what with engines, you? and now with engines like, uh, Unity and whatnot that you can get a hold of and you don't have to fork over, you know, like a million dollars, you can actually, you yourself can go produce this stuff which, you know, allows a lot of new ideas to come out. And even if you're, 
your game sucks. Like, it's the worst game ever, but it has one or two good elements in it. Someone's going to come in and be like, hey, that shit's kind of cool. I'm going to take these and I'm going to put them in my game. And then you're going to get growth. And that's something you don't get in the AAA industry. That's something uh, that, that I've seen a lot too on the, uh, the iOS platform, you know, with uh, the, the iPhone and the iPad, is that you're seeing a lot of, uh, because it, uh, that they're, I mean, like Activision and EA, you know, they've done some portable uh, iOS games, but but, but uh, there are a ton, like with the, with uh, Samogo and uh, and Half Brick, you know, there's there's a bunch of these studios making really cool games. There's tons of really really good indie stuff on the iOS platform. And also just stuff that's just pushing the boundaries of free speech and free imagery. Like, you know, uh, look at Hotline Miami. Yeah. Look at look at what that game got away with. You know, just because it's not mainstream. You know, and and it doesn't have those huge corporate interests fueling what it's allowed to say and what it's not allowed to say. So, you know, the, the games like that are really gonna bust open. That and like you guys are saying, you know, the indie people are gonna once people are sick of 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 the the official story and all the the propaganda they're just gonna and all the free speech stifling that's going on in the triple a's they, they are gonna naturally gravitate and, and with with things like the steam box coming out you know and comp in a combination with the stream steam green light program you're gonna see your average person have having this stuff front and center at their fingertips and decide for themselves rather than being told what to play they're just gonna have it there and just this looks cool i'm gonna play this and that's you know, what's really got me excited about the next couple you years. know what though this also benefits you know uh, sony and microsoft because i mean you look at microsoft and what they want to do with the xbox one and make it totally digital no disk space well you know what a lot of these indie titles are well 99% of them are pure digital you know that's also going to push them in that direction as well and you know what we might inadvertently see the end of disc based games because of this yeah I think that, that, I think that's just a matter of time but I mean I, I, there's still a, a lot of gamers that still like to have especially most of us from who have been around for a while they st still like to have a physical copy uh, of the game, but uh, you know, it, it's um, with, the, with the indie games, like you said, you know, the majority of it, it, it is digital. And I think there's going to be a lot of people that, uh, especially in this current generation, that are, are probably not going to play any of the big uh, AAA games. Now, most of them are, are, are going to be just uh, be uh, just happy just playing uh, all the really cool indie games that are uh, that are already out and coming out. Well, that, the, the indie games the... are good on your wallet too, and yes, that's, that's the other a, thing. You, you look at AAA games, you know. Point. they're yeah, they're dropping at sixty bucks, you know, to start, and you, and you get indie titles. Hell, you can get some of them for five bucks. Yeah, like Hollow Knight Miami's ten bucks. Fez is uh, right on that same price. You know, it's you know, you, you and me, boy, I think it was only about about, about uh, fifteen bucks. You know, you're getting you're getting yeah. a fantastic experience, and it's not it's not uh, it's not uh, putting like you said, Jay, it's not putting a big dent in your pocketbook. And I think over time, as we, if if that's if that is the case, the indies do start to reap some more of that success and start to uh, people start to defect over to that platform for more compelling messages and imagery and gaming platforms. Maybe that that that's that can only push the triple A's to start stepping their game up as well. And the thing is, the triple A's would never and will never really disappear because we always need those those big budget cinematic experiences. And in terms of the Xbox One going digital, I still think it's too early. I think EA and Microsoft are trying to push this digital era way too fast. Here's the reality, especially in Canada, is that bandwidth just isn't there yet. PS4 games start at like 60, 80 gigs a pop. You just wait till like 2016 when games are clocking at like 100 gigs. Are you gonna seriously like be able to download that? Like oh. in like, yeah, well, you know what? And be able to store it? Yeah, well, the you know, thing in Canada now, we, we have unlimited packages. Sorry, Joe. I'll but they're, but, but they're, uh, but they're uh, you know, like we mentioned before, you know, it, it's in Canada, Canada, we pay through the nose for internet. You know, and, and to get a really uh, high speed connection, it, it's expensive. Yeah, so to have that Xbox One Blu ray as your quick delivery device, just a quick install, you know, that, that still at this point is, is really required. So I think. I, I, the Xbox is looking at this the wrong way. They gotta get rid of Connect. They gotta go like what you're saying, Joe. Instead of going discless, they just need to drop the Connect as a mandatory. Drop the 399, and you watch the sales start to start to go up. Especially when Halo 5 gets announced, probably yeah. at E3. So getting back to censorship, though, like uh, so we 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 we've seen where it's going. We're seeing where it is. I don't know where it came from, where it is. I want to see where it's going, and especially with two kind of, probably the most recent issues in censorship. 
Uh, before we get to the major one, which is the, the bill I want to talk about with the Republicans, I want to talk about South Park, which is coming out this Tuesday, which is a different kind of censorship. This isn't violence. This isn't sex. This is good taste. Okay? Now, we already know that this game is getting heavily censored in the UK and Australia. What do you guys think about this? Like, does this matter to us? Because I think it, it's going to at some point. You go ahead. I'm going to pass that to you guys. Go ahead, Jake. This is a better one for you because you guys are more into South Park than I am. Okay, so Joe, what do you think about South Park and the censorship thing? And the, like, what, what do you, like, how does this make you feel? Well, you know, to, you know this is getting a little, a little bit into like the freedom of speech kind of thing where, where, where it's like they're, uh, it's like they're, they're telling people what, to, what kind of content they should and should not be taking in. You know, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that, that uh, you know, it's, you know, you know, people should be allowed to, to watch and play whatever they want, and not and not have these, not, not have the, the government being telling you what you should be playing. I think it's got the rating. I think once you've put that mature rating, I'm over 18. I can decide for myself what's good and whatnot. And I guess the big issues of contention that I've heard about so far is the anal probing scenes. You know, references to the first episode of South Park where Cartman gets anally probed by aliens, and then other characters get alien, anally probed. So they they the the the, the UK and Australia, they, they deem these to be too offensive against morality, so they cut them out. My problem is, is that I can see that coming here someday too. We're not too far off of that climate. I think we get away with a lot of things now here in North America. I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. What do you, what do you think about, not just South Park in general, Jay, but just the climate? Do you think we could ever get to that point? I totally think we can get to that point. I mean, we've seen, in the US especially, we've seen the right wing go far, far right wing. Um, and this has happened, you know, since uh, oh, probably the second uh, Bush election, where the Republicans have just gone stupid. I mean, it, it, I, I wouldn't even—I don't even know what to say about it. I mean, when when they're talking about, you know, um, uh, a woman can't get pregnant when she gets raped and, and, and shit like that. I, I mean, they've gone far, 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 <laughs> far, far right wing, and you have the left wing, which is now not getting much support because the U.S. seems to be mostly Republican. Um, you know that's not good for the people. Um, you know they're all about they're all worried about their Second Amendment right, Second Amendment rights and whatnot. But you know they really don't care about the freedom of speech part of it. So you know what I can see the censorship coming because they want to tell everybody what they can and can't do. I mean you, you look at what they're doing right now with the with the bill that the Republicans have in for video games, and up in Canada, I mean this is going to be coming for sure i mean i've already seen the censorship when it comes to the news media because um I i'm a big viewer of uh, ctv news i read their news posts and whatnot and um, i'm not allowed to post comments anymore every comment i post gets banned because the truth hurts so i mean if they're going to censor people uh, just based on a comment because they don't want people to know the truth i mean uh, video games i mean it's just an easy one yeah you know in a, in a, that, that uh a good point, Jay. I, th I think gate games have always been kind of like an easy kind of target for a lot of this stuff, right? So well, because it's seen as kid stuff. That's why it's it's exactly. easy. I mean, it's, it's seen exactly. as kid stuff. Let's dissect this for a second. Okay, so we're allowed to see, a, in here in Canada and the U.S., we're allowed to see a scene where Cartman gets anally raped by uh, by a UFO, but we're not allowed to see in the U.K. What does that say about us and what we decide to censor? You know, why is it okay to show sodomy, but it's not okay to have, you know, uh, anti-Obama anti views in a game or something? It's just, it's just weird how, like, again, free speech, you know, look, look, at, look at Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, okay? One of the, uh, probably the, probably the most anti-war out of all the Call of Duties, in my opinion, that I played. Um, and, and, and I'm sorry, again, I don't want to get into conspiracies here, but is it, is it any wonder that Weston Zempella got fired? after that game come out with a no Russian mission, really criticizing the military industrial complex. Activision wasn't want their own developers criticizing the, the whole complex that they're trying to promote with the Call of Duty juggernaut. Yeah, that, that wasn't just a coincidence that that happened. And you see, so, out of all the Call of Duties, that was the one I enjoyed the most. Me too. And, and that's the irony of the last point here that you kind of touched upon, Jay this new bill that the Republic, US Republican Party is trying to pass that would effectively negate tax credits for violent video game makers. 
Now, How I don't ironic is that when we push games like Call of Duty, when we push games like Battlefield in through the mainstream media, we, them the we try time. to limit, we try to punish them at the same time. That it's looks like lobbying to me. Oh, yeah, it's, it's totally lobbying. Yes. And you, you look at the U.S. and and I mean they're all worried about you know their guns and and losing their guns. You know they have no problems giving uh, a ten year old an AK-47 and you know expecting him to be totally responsible you know with that gun but when it comes to a video game where all you're doing is putting a controller in his hand that must be killing people and that doesn't make any sense there's no logic behind it it's basically a way just to get votes get get campaign money it's like okay activision pay up you want to keep making call of duty sequels pay up you know, unless you want to get, you know, sucked into the black hole. And that will never happen because they know they need these games to push propaganda. But like you said, I mean, it's, it's, and that's the thing. Again, really going back to why some of these major auteurs in the game industry are just leaving the, the, the mainstream side. They're like, you know what? Let's go to Kickstarter. Look at, uh, look at like project number nine, right? Mega Man, but with a different name. Yeah. You know, they, they got out of the sinking ship that was Capcom. Capcom's almost done. Yeah. And that, you know what, that's going to suck too, because I mean, well, us being older gamers, you know, the 30 plus gamers, you know, we grew up with Capcom games, uh, Street Fighter and whatnot, you know, like we, we grew up with that stuff, you know, and to see them go is going to hurt, but you know what, they, they did that to themselves. Yeah, I, yeah, and I want to dispel, like, oh, this would be catastrophic for the industry if, if Capcom, this could lead to another game crash. Again, just going back to the sensationalism of mainstream press that, you know, we, we survived the Sega turmoil, I'm, I'm sure we can, you know, it, it's sad again to see, you know, I don't think Capcom's going anywhere. I think they've got a little bit of momentum now, um, now with Strider, and, and, but that's another another topic. Really, I don't think this bill, th this bill is probably gonna pass. It, it just seems like the, the, the mechanisms are in place to allow this to happen, and it's just gonna further make a case for the indies to, to rise up and like you're saying jay become the next triple a's it's like okay well if i'm stifled here i'm just gonna go here because with the internet this is a big global village now there's lots of places to make your name and but say when your I, piece when i look at this bill from an outside perspective from a political standpoint you know what it's a really smart idea i mean like you were saying mike you know with you know pretty much buying your buying the vote and you know what, from a political standpoint, that's really smart. And you know what, um, up here in Canada, we're seeing Harper doing the same thing right now with the Ukraine. He's doing the exact same thing. He's got his uh, fingers in those pies, pretty much uh, telling them, oh, throw a fit about what uh, the Liberal Party says. So that way they look bad. It's a very smart political move for your party, but is it good for the people? No, it's not good for the people. And and that's the issue that we're, we're dealing with right now, you know, with regards to politics is, politics are no longer for you know about the people anymore it's just about the the parties and about the ideals and you know what that's going to create a lot of bad shit especially for the gaming industry you know like this this bill i mean there's no research even behind it it's just bullshit they pulled out of their ass like the uh getting not getting not being able to get pregnant while getting raped i mean it's just bullshit they pulled out of their ass but they spoon feed it to a certain you know psychotic couple people and it gets spread and it becomes truth and, and that's you know a lot of the problems that we're going to be dealing with in the future i think and, and you know what this could really hurt the economy you know this the, the u.s economy specifically because what it's going to do is it's going to force people to move it's going to force developers to leave go to canada go to switzerland go wherever they have to go you know, and, and where, the, where like, like you think this is going to affect Rockstar? No, they're they're based out of the the out of uh, Scotland, man. Like, you know, this is they're, they're I guess in a sense they're somewhat immune to this bill. I don't know, but they're still. Well, under no, the 2K, other thing but... about Rockstar, Rockstar also has an office in Toronto. That's true. And you know what? The nice thing up here is we don't have censorship like that. But um, you know what? Our government is already trying to pull these US game developers out by offering tax credits for video game developers in Canada. And all it takes is a modification of those of those parameters to say, okay, now we're giving these tax credits, but now we're going to restrict who we give these tax credits to. And we're not far behind. Yep. You know, people like to think that Canada is so much better than US, but you know what? Again, another podcast, another topic, but Harper's is, is right in there. With, with the rest of the decision makers. We're just a little, we, ju we just like, we like to pretend that we're a little more provocative over here. And, and for now, maybe we are, but. Uh, I, I don't know if you, if, 
Sorry, Joe. I hope that that doesn't uh, kill. I mean, I mean, look at uh, that uh, Phil Fish with Fez. I mean, he, he that, that that's how he was able to develop that game with a, with a, with a grant from the from the government. And look at what he created. I mean, it, it took him a fuck of a long time to do it. You know, but he made, in my opinion, uh, an excellent game with with that. So uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I hope that, that that doesn't get affected too much here, and that, 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 like you said, hopefully it'll attract some. I mean, we already have a lot of extremely good developers in Canada, but you know, I'd like to see that stay in and, and attract some of those people up here. But you know what? The nice thing about about these tax credits and whatnot, they they don't just apply to video games. They've also applied to movies. I mean, we've seen some really, really, really good independent movies come out specifically out of Canada, and you can tell because they have the Ontario tax credit in their uh, credits at the end. Uh, one that comes to mind right now is Pontypool, which is an absolutely great movie, and, you know, filmed in uh, northern Ontario, and it's a zombie movie, and it shows no zombies. I mean, it's an absolutely great movie, and the nice thing about it is that it might be government-funded, but there's no censorship. Exactly. Oh, look yeah. at the East Coast. And another good Go ahead, example Joe. is that uh, is that uh, the show that uh, Les Stroud, a former executive at Much Music, with Survivor Man. Yeah, with, Survivor Man's great. With, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the tax credit, and he's uh, allowed to basically do what he wants. It's not completely uncensored, you know, but he, he has a lot of artistic freedom. Yeah, he has well, to follow look. standard rules, you know, like for for television, you know, like swearing and whatnot. But I mean, yeah, I mean, and that was an absolutely great show. Well, look at the East Coast. Look at look, look at the major industry that's going on on the East Coast of Canada, and, and like PI uh, specifically, Nova Scotia. I mean, look at look at what look, look what Trailer Park Boys did for that industry over there by using tax credits, getting off the ground, and, and in a sense. Maybe it really. Maybe that's part of the plan. Maybe we need to start giving back more power through our votes to these provincial governments that can enable their local artists to, to do things and to push our identity forward. And 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 there, you have some really provocative stuff coming out of the East Coast because they really have their own industry. And same thing with Quebec. They have their own self-contained industry where they say whatever the fuck they want, whether people like it or hate it. And I know a lot of people don't like it, but. And that's the thing. Maybe, maybe it's just the fact that we need to start voting in, you know, premiers that can that can enable more shit like this to happen with less restrictions. But the problem that we we all know is that when it comes to Republicans and conservatives, the first thing they always do when they get elected is they cut funding to arts, anything creative. You know, they're and, exactly the same party. Yeah, it's thrown into the uh, military-industrial complex, and that's where it sits. We, we, and that's not only politics, we see it everywhere. You know, going through university, I saw it. The, the arts and humanities disciplines got no funding, nothing. Our film department got nothing. We had old textbooks, old classrooms. Who got the funding? Med school, business school, law school. These are the things that our culture in general, our society in general pushes. So really, the only solution I can see is grassroots, which is what Double Fine's doing right now. Pretty much all, well, their latest project, Broken Age, got funded through Kickstarter, and it's a very real reality. And, and that, I think that is going to make them more, more profit in the long run because they're they're eliminating so much infrastructure there and, and taking back so much more of that that direct dollar. And Joe, you turned me on to that new site, um, Patreon. Patreon, a very very cool, similar to, to Kickstarter for content creators like us. Yeah, but basically, uh, you, you get your, your 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 patrons, which is kind of you know a little play on the, the name of the, of the, of the uh, service. To uh, every every time you put on a piece of content, they 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 uh, they give you a little bit. It's it's a it's a good way to uh, to get people to support your content and to, to motivate you to keep putting out content for them. And the nice thing is about all this is it's a push against censorship, which is nice too because you know what, like on this podcast, we can talk about whatever we want. You know, we don't have to worry about censorship. And, you know, th that's the nice thing about Kickstarter and all that. We don't deal with censorship. Censorship's done at the publisher level and at other levels. But, you know, when it comes to this stuff, we can actually speak our mind. You know, whether, you know, we take flack for it or not, that's our own problem. But we have that option. Whereas, you know, like in the mainstream nowadays, no, you, you don't have any option. You're forced into censorship. That's why. That's why I, 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 I really enjoy the, the, what we started here, is because I, I, I do feel that uh, you know, it's like a sense of freedom to be able to, to speak what you want. And I, I really enjoy that. 
Why, and using these democratic platforms like, you know, getting on, like starting out on YouTube, then getting onto Patreon, and then getting onto Ustream, and using those as new avenues of, of like, financial revenue to keep your show going, but it also brings you closer to your audience, like directly on the comment field, in the email field, like whether to it, it, it can be a detriment too, in the case of, you know, Total Biscuit, who is basically disabled comments and, and likes on his page because he was just getting trolled so hard. But, you know, you're, you're essentially with, like, with Patreon. Your, your viewers are always kind of basically becoming like your producers. Absolutely, yeah. and and it's like it's, again, it's just it's really because this internet whole this thing is such a wild new frontier. I keep saying this over and over. It's like we're like in like the state that Hollywood was in in the 1910s, the Chaplin era. You know, the Keystone Cops era, where the rules hadn't really been made yet. You know, and we're we're making the rules as we go, and that's why again, if you if you feel like you're not being able to say what you can and you feel that the system's taking you down, well, it's, it's time to take a risk and get out there into this new frontier while, while the rules still haven't been written yet. Yeah, like right now, we're, we're almost in the, the renaissance of the internet, but, you know, you know, where we have free speech, we can do whatever we want, but we're only kind of in that because, you know what, we've had uh, issues with the U.S. government turning around and saying, we own the internet, everybody's going to follow our rules, and, and we've had that happen. We have China with their great firewall, you know, it, we've got to bring down these barriers and, and let this medium take take us wherever the hell it takes us, you know? Well, then it comes down to awareness. People need to start reading up on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and understand where internet regulation is going and to start voting these fuckers out of office. But as long as people are going to be blind towards the stuff and like, oh, it's over my head, oh, it's boring, oh, I don't want to think about it, doesn't apply to me, no, it will. Like, it's it's going to apply to everybody and what you see, whether you're a broadcaster or a viewer, it's going to affect what you're able to create, what you're able to view. Yeah, and as, as adults, I mean, we technically can view whatever the hell we want. I mean, we earned that right when we got to be 18, so why... It, what makes the government think they have the right to step in and tell us, oh, no, you can't view this, you can't do that? It's because of our allegiance to the idea of the nanny state and our, our total blood. And that's what's happened in the UK and Australia. It's just like allowing the government to dictate what you're allowed, like as adults, as adults, what I'm allowed to see in the South Park game. That is a slap in the face. That's disgusting to me. It's like I, I'm old enough to make decisions for myself. It has the rating. It's not going to get in the hands of kids technically because it's got the rating. So what the hell? And and again, because I, I see it all the time, the nanny state happening here in North America under Obama and Harper. It's, it's you know, we may think that we're free now, but it, it, we, we when you really look at what we lose, the freedoms we lose every year, and, and also with the neocon media coming out and saying this is offensive to say, that's offensive to say, you know, eventually it's going to affect us because right now we're small time here on Joystick Justice League. We've only got about 24 subscribers, but let's say one day we have a million subs all of a sudden, it's it's good. we're going to be getting in trouble a lot more. You know, it's going to be it, it, you're going to that's that's my fear that the bigger you get, the more stifled you are. And I think but, that's what the video game industry as a whole is feeling right now. But if you're so, independent still, yeah. I mean, really, it's not an issue. I mean, you can still be an indie developer and have those kind of that kind of uh, a pull with people. I mean, look at Minecraft. Minecraft was an independently developed game, and it is by far one of the biggest games in the world at the moment. And I think uh, another developer is probably feeling that right now is, is uh, Team is uh, Team Me. I mean, now uh, with, with the with the tremendous success they had with Super Meat Boy, and now with their next upcoming game, New Jackson, they've got a lot more people that they're reaching, and they've got a lot more money to work with. You know, that, I bet you that those guys are feeling some of that as well. But, but it's it's just funny, like, again, having seen Indie the Game, the movie, relying on a publisher to d do good by you and seeing how that can go horribly wrong, they've been very quiet, other than their, their very great blog, but, like, there hasn't been a lot of hype around eugenics, you know, they, they're, they're really doing this on their own. And, and that, I would say the same thing of, like, Binding of Isaac, I mean, really... You know, Edwin kind of, you know, I, the, the, the mainstream press got a little bit on it, but it really it was just word of mouth and, and the grassroots industry and the fact that people knew that it was coming from one of the makers of Super Meat Boy that just drives it. And I think that, yeah, as, as uh, you know, if people want to see this industry changed for the better, then you've got to start getting more involved. You've got to start sharing and liking things you like. Stop being a little bump on the log. And saying, oh, well, I saw it, it's great. I'm just assuming that these people are getting support without my support, so I'm not gonna do anything to support these people. Get on forums, comment. If you don't like what you're seeing, speak up. 
If you like what you're seeing, share it with others, because that's how the videos get views, you know? That's one thing that we've been noticing. We've been getting a decent number of views, but very, very few people are, are, are commenting. And I'll say this right now to, to people that are watching our stuff. Feel free to feel free to comment if you don't like stuff that we're that we're doing. Say it, say it, and, and we can we can uh, kind of adjust things accordingly. Yeah, and all the people who are giving us the thumbs down. That's fine. You that's your opinion. Give but us a reason least, for it. Give us a reason. Don't just you know, oh, uh, this sucks. Fuck you. Well, that if if you want us to be better, if you're that invested to give us a thumbs down, then tell us what you want to see. Going back on on speaking your voice. I mean, we don't want to happen you know like what happened with mario party 8 in the uk you know where just because you use a word you know you have oh, to get God. banned you know let everybody know i mean like w when you see what happened there because you said spastic i mean we we should have had an outcry from people saying what the fuck are you doing banning it because of that i mean like come on yeah, the, the the background on that was because in the UK, the term spastic is slang for uh, somebody who's mentally handicapped or whatever. Or no, no, physically handicapped or something. And they, they took offense, so they had to edit that word out of Mario Party. That, 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 that is just not an offensive, really worthy thing, in my, in my opinion. And, and for, a, for, for a Mario game, I mean, that, that, that's just reaching for... for for that kind of stuff, you know. Well, spastic. considering we know we know Nintendo's standpoint, you know, like when it when it comes to stuff, I mean, they, they try to promote just to kids. I mean, you look at the majority of their games; they're geared towards kids. So you know they would have you know made a point of okay, we're gonna make sure this game is perfect for kids, and then something like that gets banned in the UK. I mean, give me a break. It's a word that has multiple meanings, but also, come on, people, if you really want to get down to this, sticks and stones will break my bones. Where did that whole, I was taught that when dealing with bullies when I was a kid, with people who made fun of me. It's like sticks and stones, man, just like it's a name. It doesn't mean anything, but that's the thing. We've, we've invested so much in these words now. We're all such pussies. I'm going to say it. You are all pussies if you are offended by a word. Get you, a backbone. You know what, what, what I'll say? If, if you don't like certain things that are being said in certain games, like, uh, like spastic or, or any of that kind of if you're not liking that in a game don't play it don't don't, don't continue to, to, to play it and keep bitching about it just for for something for you to do if you don't like it don't play it yeah i totally that think is, that should yeah. be everybody's you know idea when it comes to stuff. if you don't like it don't play it don't watch it i mean uh the movie american psycho i watched like about a half hour 45 minutes of it and i was so disturbed and disgusted i turned it off I didn't go start emailing my MP saying, ban this fucking movie because it's horrible and, and, you know, it shows murder and everything. No. I mean, I don't like it. I don't watch it. I don't I don't sit there and, you know, watch girly movies either. But, but it doesn't mean I want the band. These complaints come from people who are easily led, who are mindless, and they assume that the rest of us are as mindless and easily led as they are. It's like, oh, it offended me, so it's got to offend everybody. It's yeah, just all totally this, this large putting this importance over above themselves, like as if like they're they're the barometer for the human condition, it's, and it's, that just pisses me off. It's, 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 a, it's a matter of personal taste, you know. I talked we talked about this on the uh, first episode of my own show every day, and we uh, could touch on uh, on music, for example. You know, like a, a certain person might may, may, may like uh, like a, 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 like alternative music. I'm not going to go to somebody who likes country music, for example. I may not like it. But I'm not going to show over something because they like that particular kind of music. To to, to them, that, that, like that, that's probably their favorite kind of music for them. That's what uh, what really does it for them. You can't just shit over uh, something just because you personally don't like it and say, "Well, oh, because I don't like this, nobody else is going to like it." Yeah, like when we were in school, we were all taught that everybody was unique and you know what and it shows everybody has their own personal tastes their personal interests and whatnot so long as it isn't hurting people what is the problem so you know what like like joe was just saying you know with country music i don't like country music either but i'm not gonna go shit on someone because they like country music that's their personal opinion and that's the way we need to look at things because otherwise we're stifling freedom of speech ourselves and yeah, let's take it one more step further. I, I speak out regularly against like Jay Z, Katy Perry, like these like these people propagating Illumini, Illuminati symbolism to kids. I have never once said that you need to be censored or banned. I said you need to understand this stuff, and if you do not believe in this, turn it off. Okay, stop letting it affect you. Okay, if you think that your life is shit because you listen to this music and it's having an effect on you, it's easy. Turn it off. Understand their alternatives. Stop 
relying on top 40 radio. Stop to tell you what to listen to. Stop relying on the Oscars to tell you what the best picture is. I'm sick of people not being able to think for themselves. It's like we all have to agree and fight because Forrest Gump beat Pulp Fiction and Shawshank Redemption in 1994. Who gives a fuck, man? Yeah, I mean, we need to be an informed society. As an informed society, we're all good people because we fully understand the consequences of everything and the choices that we make. When we're not informed, we're ignorant. And it's starting to show in almost every industry how ignorant we really are. But that's the thing, man. When all these 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 solo idols keep pushing on like 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 blindness and ignorance as the cool and especially when you combine that with like fashion magazines and co lifestyle magazines and, and and regs like the Fluffington Post all pushing like this unaware hipster cool mentality it's 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 not cool it's cool to be ignorant it's cool to be uninformed because it's all bad so let's just ignore it and just let it perpetuate and let's just be cool and, and buy things so we can forget about it uh, in Kind of repeating what you guys said. You know, people just gotta go think for their own, think for themselves, find their, their own personal taste, go with that, and, and don't, and don't like, like we said with uh, like we said with American Psycho, Jay. Like when you, when you watch that, just because you personally uh, didn't like it, don't go out on one of these forums and, and try and tell people, no, because I didn't like this, I I know that you're not gonna like it. Everybody, just just think for yourselves, find your own personal taste, and enjoy what you what you watch yeah. and what you play and what you listen to. Because you know what's going to happen, you're going to get somebody like me who enjoyed American Psycho coming out and saying, well, it's actually a satire on, on like, on the, the American yuppie culture of the 80s. And then that just, it's just more, div, div, it's just, you're just bringing, like, people think that because they have this strong opinion, they're going to go out and everybody's just going to agree with you. No, you're going to get somebody, this has happened to me too, you're going to get somebody who's well-versed and probably make you look like an idiot and just make you angrier and, and it's just a self-perpetuating cycle. So, you know what, this is the, the big picture. For the parents that are listening to this right now, let's end the show off with something positive. So getting back, okay, fine, everything's fucked up, censorship's on the rise, violent video games are out there, your kids are, oh my God, they're gonna turn into little killers. What can we say to parents to make you feel better about this? You know what, I would say, you know what, sit down and talk with your kids. You know what? Spend time watching what they play. You know, what? even play it with them. I mean, like the Lego Star Wars games and, and, and Lego Marvel superheroes and all that, they're fun to play. And, you know, Absolutely. as a parent, you can get right into that shit. But, you know what? Just because a game has an M rating doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. You know what? You got to realize that the media right now throws everything at parents. They, they throw everything at everybody. I mean, you have violence everywhere. You, you, you turn on the news, you got violence. You turn on your, you know, nightly show or whatever, there's violence. What you need to do is sit down and explain to your kids that what you're seeing isn't real. That's that's not real. And then show them, you know, like we have YouTube now, you know, bring up, you know, what's going on in the world today and show them this is what actually happens. You know what? That, that guy fell down. He got shot. He's dead. He's never getting back up. There's no respawn. And you know what? Once you explain shit to your kids, kids aren't stupid. You know what? Kids, their brain works probably 10 times faster than yours and they can assimilate information 10 times faster you know what remember that and you know teach your kids properly and you know what you don't need to stop you know buying games from them because it's got a certain rating on it it all depends on the child and you know what if you sit down and spend the time with your kids and explain it to them you're not going to have any problems yeah and i'll just re reiterate what jay said you know teach your kids to, to think for themselves and sit down and talk with them and tell them, you know what, <clears throat> just, just, just think for yourself, let, and sit down and talk to them, and, let, and let, like Jay said, let them know that, uh, you know, what, what, what's, what's happening in this game doesn't actually happen in, in real life. You know, all, like I said, just, just educate them and just sit down and, and just uh, <clears throat> have a good one-on-one -on -one with your kids and, just, and, and, and teach them, like I said, number one, to think for themselves, make their own decisions about this kind of stuff, and, and go from there. And to take it even one step further from what you guys are saying, to kind of put a reverse non-pedagogy spin, because maybe you're afraid of sounding like a preacher to your kids. Maybe you're afraid that you're only concentrating on the negative, that this isn't real. Why don't you try the bait and switch? If you really admire an M-rated game and you want to play, like, let your kid play it, like say, Bioshock Infinite, why don't you instead 
Tell them about the great things about the game, that the production design, the use of music, the use of voice acting. Get passionate about it. Get passionate about the good things. Get their cultural awareness up. L teach them how to decode great art and, and, and why this is important to us, why we need to say these things good or bad, why this makes us better people when we understand not only good things but bad things and we can learn to think for ourselves. Get into it with them. Just you know, yeah, fine. This is this isn't real. This guy doesn't get up. But also, like, if it's GTA Five, focus on the satire. Focus on the comedy. Focus on the graphics. Focus on on all these hundred plus gameplay elements coming into one package. Like, talk about like like dish on how um, you know like what Rockstar has done for for bullying like other games you know with bully and stuff just just get, maybe put a positive spin on it too to kind of go with the warning label yeah just help, help them develop the just help them develop you know a no bullshit kind of filter you know, just, passion just, yeah exactly and and, and and not just point out the negatives but like you said point out the, the positives the sublime them. nature of what you're playing and, like and sit down with them and, and by doing that, you, you, you might uh, get a kid really interested. You might be a kid that ends up going and developing games. Yeah, I've got one I, of those right now. Exactly. Exactly. When you can, when you can make, when you can show them the bigger picture of what, how great this industry could be. When you, when you show them like. Like, like what, what, like when you show them like interviews with developers and the passion that goes into making these projects. And yes, I have a nephew too who's interested in programming because I've sat down with him many times. And now, like when he talks about Pokemon or Minecraft, I sit and I kind of give him the, the the metatextual reading of it, and, and I make it bigger for him than it is. You know, it's like this is what it means historically. This is what it means in culture. It's not just a game. This is a piece of culture. When, when and the, once they understand that, man. One that I would personally recommend is uh, you go up on YouTube right now and, and look at the uh, the making of The Last of Us. If you want, you want to see, you want, want, yeah. and you'll, you'll really see that they show really in depth of, of what their process is. And it, it was uh, I had a great time watching it, and, and they, they do it in a very cool way. And I and you know that, that's that's about uh, uh, an M kind of rated game, but uh, I, I would also recommend showing it to kids. It's showing them like a, they, they do it in a very kind of non traditional way as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jay, anything else before we kind of wrap this up? Yeah, uh, just to parents, don't let your kids watch Smosh. Oh my <laughs> god, you want to see some horrible garbage? You know what, I'm a really lenient parent and I'll let a lot of shit slide. Don't watch fucking Smosh. <laughs> my kids watch that religiously and every bad trait they have ever had they got from that fucking stupid show. That's, right, <laughs> okay? uh, that that's like, it for me. That and like Jersey Shore and all that kind of shit. Right. So guys, this has been a very, very educational whirlwind of a round table on uh, the irony of video game censorship. This this debate by no means is closed. It's, it's evolving, hopefully for the better. I hope not for the worse. People, if you're watching this, if you have a view, please comment. Let's let's keep this discussion going. If we see enough debate around this, we will do a follow-up podcast. And if you can change our opinions on things, if you can give us new insight, that only makes it better for everybody else. So. Fantastic episode of Roundtable. I'd like to thank our special guest, Mr. Jay Couture of uh, Rico Gaming, and my co host, Joe Morin. I'm Mike Frusios. Uh, make sure you subscribe to us on Joystick Justice League. Like us on Facebook. Uh, anything else before we wrap up, guys? Not good. Yeah, it's, uh, and uh, just another side thing, also check out, uh, check out our, our uh, blogs. Uh, Mike on the Alarm Bell Network on WordPress, and uh, me on uh, blogspot.ca at at joemorin.blogspot.ca and uh, stay tuned for, for a lot more really cool content, guys. Lots of great content, guys. All right, guys. Well, thanks for listening, and we'll see you on the next episode of Roundtable. Peace. Peace and game on. <laughs>